Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. This is Chris Um, and I'd like to welcome you to another uh, broadcast of, about your Kundalini Awakening experience. Uh, I'd like to wish everyone a happy new year. This is January 8th. Uh, 2014, I wish and I hope for all of you who are listening to this right now or in the future in the archives, a beautiful, wonderful, happy, enlightened 2014. And, uh, and I would just like to say at this time that for those of you who are new to this program, there are other vectors of information. Uh, there's a YouTube that gives you about almost 300 videos on your Kundalini Awakening experience, and that is at chrism.kundalini on the YouTube uh, network. There's also Kundalini Awakening Systems, the number one, dot com, and that's all one word, and you can reach that just by writing that into Google. It'll take you right there. There's also uh, groups on Yahoo called Kundalini Awakening Systems 1 at Yahoo Groups, and a group on uh, Facebook called Kundalini Awakening exclamation point, as well as uh, Kundalini Healing, which is on both the Facebook and the Yahoo networks. And uh, we have a few announcements, and I'd like to to bring uh, uh, Her Holiness Amelia Centara on to make her announcements. Hello, uh, Amelia Centara. Hello. Hi, hello, Chris, and Happy New Year to you and to everybody listening. It's good to be here. I'm really looking forward to today's topic and to hearing what it will be about. Um, my um, announcements have to do with, first of all, the seminars um, that are coming up in the new year. I am organizing two seminars, and Rosemary is organizing another seminar in September. So let me speak about mine to begin with. The seminars that I'm organizing are happening in March on the 22nd and the 23rd of March. And this, this seminar is taking place in New York. Um, and I'm really looking forward to meeting people in New York from the East Coast because I know somebody, a few people who are going to come by bus um, and different modes of transport into New York. And that's good. That's a very exciting thing to be having the seminar on the East Coast. It's our first time having a Kundalini Awakening seminar in that part of the United States. So if you have an interest in coming to New York and meeting with Chrism and meeting with other Kundalini Awakening people, um, please write to me and let me know of your interest in attending. And my email is Kundalini Matters at gmail.com and then the following weekend prison will be flying from new york to america to ireland and the following weekend we have a european seminar and that takes place in dublin or rather county Leeds, which is just 30 minutes from dublin airport so for those of you interested in flying in from europe it's actually quite a short distance from the airport to where the venue is and transport will be arranged and the dates for that again are the 29th and the 30th of march so again if you have an interest in that please do write to me at kundalini matters at gmail.com so that's it uh, thank, thank you. you thank you thank you amelia centara thank you and i'm going to hand this over to rosemary she's going to give you some information about the uh the seminar that's going up in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, United States. Thank you, Chris, and hello, particularly to people, anybody from the Midwest, uh, first of all, and throughout the United States. Chris will be coming to Minneapolis, St. Paul, next September 27th and 28th, and we have a few people there, like myself, that are part of the Kundalini community. And we're welcoming others also. We look forward to a group, a great group. We have the place set, and they are very kind and gracious for us. And you will have more information. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, Rosemary. Yes, uh, uh, we do have a few of the, the seminars set up. And I would like to thank Rosemary and Amelia Centara for being the point people and for really creating this out of the uh, – the essence of their own love and their own Kundalini awakening uh, expression. So thank you both. Thank you both. Uh, if you want to make a donation, 
uh, for the work that's done here. As you know, I don't charge uh, people for Shakti Pod and, and for giving out this information. If you want to make a, a donation uh, to keep us going, uh, you can do so at Ascension Dash Kundalini at blogspot dot com, and uh, just if you just put in Ascension Kundalini into Google, it'll it'll pretty much lead you right to that blog. But it is on Blogspot, and uh, you'll see a uh, you'll see a donation. Uh, button up in the upper uh, right-hand area of that uh, page on the blog. So if you'd like to to make a donation for what we're doing here, it would be much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, It's not required, however, and you don't get more kundalini if you give more money. It just doesn't work that way. But any any kind of uh, uh, kind, considerate uh, donation is is, uh, gratefully welcomed. Today... Let's let's go ahead and get right into our into our uh, our, our talk here, our conversation. Uh, Amelia, can you come online again? Can you come on the mic? Yes, yes I'm, here. I'm here. Yeah, um, I can't see the chat room. So if you can, you know, if if anybody's in the chat room, if you can kind of, you know. Uh, relay a question that they may have to me because I can't see it and and feel free to interrupt me it's fine uh but I would you know to answer any of those questions I'll need you to relay them can you see the chat group yes I can indeed Kristen and I've already invited people to write in so let me welcome Suka and Linda as guests all the different guests there's about seven or eight guests at the moment, and um, plus those, those others. So, indeed, um, I will relate any questions or comments to you, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. And if anybody would like to call in, the number is United States Area Code 347-934-0026. 347-934-0026. Well, I would like to welcome everyone to this Kundalini conversation. I'd like to welcome those in the chat room. Even though I can't see you, uh, I know that you are there, and I, I appreciate your attendance uh, uh, as we as we do this in a live format. And any questions that you may have for those of you in the chat group, feel free to either write them out, and Amelia will, will uh, relay them to me, or you can call in at 347-934-0026, and, uh, and you and I, can discuss your question. Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody who is listening to this in the archives. Thank you for joining us in the archives. All right. Uh, as with most, not all, but most, I would say 90, 95 percent of the conversations we're having here, I typically am not given any indication from the Kundalini where the conversation is going to go, what the title of the conversation is going to be, these types of things. Much of this is extemporaneous, except Kundalini is not extemporaneous. It just, it's just not uh, choosing to, to give me that information right off the bat. But I do know one thing that, it, that, is inter- that the Kundalini, in me at least, is interested in talking about, and that is within the Kundalini awakening uh, situation, Especially if if it hasn't come to you, uh, like you haven't had a, a you know a a difficult childhood, or you haven't had a lot of karmic uh, preparation uh, for the kundalini to come, uh, it can be more difficult for you than for the person that had the difficult childhood or the difficult karmic balances that occur. Uh, in the early years and the teen years before a person is is allowed, you know, really to be free, at least in the United States. Uh, I don't know how it would be in Africa or, you know, the Africa or the China or something. But, uh, or somewhere. but if, you're, if you're being called to the Kundalini and you didn't go through any of these early, very, very difficult things, some of your karma will be difficult, and it is supposed to be. Some of these difficult uh, experiences within the Kundalini are there to condition 
your soul, condition your body, condition your ego into becoming more refined so that you can have and hold a kundalini activation. Many of the ancients will say, oh, hey, awakening the kundalini is easy. Uh, you know, holding it and keeping it in your life is what can be very, very difficult because the kundalini knows you. It sees right into you, sees right into your whole life equation, why you even have a life. And it allows you to begin purposeful, concentrated karmic balancing. And this means that difficulties will be coming your way. Not because you've done anything bad, not because this is evil, not because this is bad, not because of any of those, those false reasons. It's because you need to balance that karma. What has been given must be received. What has been received must be given. As above, so below. As within, so without. And so uh, the karmic balancing that the Kundalini brings to a person is based in uh, the, the separation and the blending of the two that are one and the one that is two. Uh, if you look at it from a, a Taoist uh, standpoint, you know the, uh, the two little teardrops t- chasing each other. One's white with a black eye and one's black with a white eye. Well, kundalini people stand on the edge of the coin that would be the Tao. We stand on that thin edge. Uh, you, some of you in the States have heard, you know, that thin dime. Well, that's a 10-cent coin for those of you that aren't in the United States. And, and we have a saying here, you know, you can't stand on the, on the rim of that thin dime. And, and, well, that's where the kundalini places us. We stand on the rim of the thin coin that is the Tao. And as we're standing on the edge of that coin, our kundalini karma is coming up for us, given to us by our kundalini, so that we can find our balance by, by honoring, honoring the message and the teaching that karma gives. You may not know how you may have made others suffer or, you, or how you suffered in other lifetimes before you come into this expression. And you don't need to know. All you need to know is as you are uh, pursuing the kundalini and as, as you are doing the practice, as you are doing the, and, and I'm going to quote things from, from our, uh, you know, from the practices that we teach uh, within Kundalini Awakening Systems 1, uh, as you do your service, as you do your surrender, as you do your tolerance, your honesty, your, your compassion, your healing, as you do these things, karmas will come up that are directly related to what it is you're doing within your equation. Uh, so, for instance, um, uh, you're walking down the street and a man collapses with a heart attack. And you ha- you're all of a sudden you're faced with a choice. Do you help this person or do you walk on by hoping that the appropriate help will reach this person? Okay. Within a kundalini context, you're being given a choice to give and to serve uh, a fellow human being within compassion and grace and love and service. And if you walk by that, that karma that you just created may come back to haunt you later on in your kundalini awakening process. And so I really want you to look twice at that man who is laying down on the sidewalk. And I don't care if other people are around him in the system assisting him. The, the very least that a kundalini person can do is to stand there and let the kundalini reach into this man, reach into him. And even if you're just standing there saying prayers, we'll just... Well, pretend that you don't know any first aid. You don't know to how to help a person with a, with, a, with a heart attack or a potential heart attack. If you stand there and you pray to the kundalini to help this man, you are indeed giving of first aid in a spiritual context. You are indeed giving this, this person service from a spiritual kundalini refinement context. So there are many, many ways, not always you know, putting in a physical hand and, you know, direct pressure on a bleeding organ. It's, it's not always that way. Sometimes 
you know, the person has the appropriate help or has other people around them helping them, but you just need to stand there and let your kundalini into the equation. This not only communicates to you that, oh, hey, I'm, I'm giving this person some service. This, the kundalini also sees that you made a choice. You made a choice uh, out of your busy day or whatever you're doing to, to see to the safety and the comfort and the, and the assistance of a fellow human being. And this is a big deal. This kind of selfless love, big deal within the kundalini context. So know this and, and, and remember this. And even as you pass an accident on the freeway or the highway, uh, say a prayer for those people. Say a prayer for those police and those ambulance drivers or those firefighters. Say a prayer for them to your kundalini to help them and then just release from it. Don't watch to see if it works. You don't have to follow the ambulance to the hospital to see if your kundalini prayer worked on that patient. <laughs> you'll, probably, you'll probably get a ticket for following that ambulance too close anyway. So don't look to see uh, for acute physical uh, validation that your prayer has worked or that your kundalini uh, energy has indeed revived that individual or not. Trust, trust, trust that your kundalini has given that person what they need to have. Trust in that commitment that the kundalini has with you and that hopefully you have with the kundalini. So there's that. And if you have any questions about this, the number is 347-934-0026. Feel free to ask any questions with regards to that. Um, right now, I would like to talk about uh, commitment. And some of these commitments that I'm going to talk about are not consciously made by people pursuing kundalini all they know is that they must do a certain thing and they don't know why they don't know about kundalini they don't know anything they just know that they must do a certain thing and in this case uh i have a guest here a beautiful beautiful wonderful person you've heard her many times on this program her name is rosemary goliath and she is uh, uh, she was a Catholic nun for 25 years. She left at the, her house, her home, her family at the age of 16 to join uh, a convent and to become a, a, um, a person who has the intention of becoming uh, a Catholic nun. And, and uh, I would like to welcome her to this radio program. Hello, Rosemary. Hi there, Kristen. And all our listeners and those in the archives as well. Happy New Year. Uh, Rosemary, uh, as you were growing up, did you all of a sudden just uh, have the idea that, that you were going to be a Catholic nun? I mean, did you see it in a dream? Had you wanted to do that since you were a baby? I mean, tell us a little bit about that. No, it was not like that. I was in high school and was taught by the sisters whose community I joined, and there were classmates of mine that had been there, some of them from other parts of the state, like a boarding school, and they came as intending to, to become sisters at the end of high school. I I was in that setting. I knew about that. It wasn't anything that was uh, there for me, uh, urging me to do uh, until in my the later part of my senior year when my classmates took that really formal step and got a, a simple habit, that clothing that they wore, and something in my heart just, it was just as Chris was saying, you know something. You don't have any, I didn't have any logical reason. My mother thought I was in all kinds of difficulty of what in the world was going on because I didn't tell her until 10 days before either. And I didn't ask the, the sisters to receive me either until 10 days, which is very unusual. And, but they, they knew me there from the, being a student. So that's how it was. And I wasn't sure at that time of my going if, I, if, I, if God was really serious or if I was going to stay there. I knew that this beginning step was essential. And I, I am grateful that I did that. And then... Uh, there was 
within those next six months where I, all of a sudden, I said, yes, this is for real. I am going to stay here. And I, I was there, as got trained as a teacher and did that and then did um, some chaplaincy work also. And, and then, likewise, similarly, and just as much a mystery, is that it was it was time for me to leave there and it was it was like there was something more for me to find and that's the simplest way that I know how to say that uh did you have any kind of dreams or anything of a kundalini nature that may have occurred while you were as a nun i mean did you did you have uh, serpent dreams or did you did you dream of angels? Did you dream of giving people healing? What what may have occurred for you, if anything? No, it, there wasn't anything like that. I would say I was aware of, in some way, of God's guidance. And Chris, and you've referred to that a number of times about what that time has given me, and and that's given me a great appreciation for it now, which I didn't see then, but now in the Kundalini process, I see that was to be part of my process. Well, I have to say that, you know, just judging from my own observation of your progress and, and your process, you're, you're doing very well. You're moving, you're moving uh, quickly. You're moving solidly uh, into your process. And it's, it's very, it's, it's very validating to see, to see you do that. Um, what attracted you to Kundalini at all? I can't. That's not anything that was that was logical or that was um, clear. Even then, I had heard the word Kundalini before, just once, and then I saw an article by uh, Chrisom in a uh, magazine in St. Paul, and I and it was about service. And I said, "Oh, I think I like that. That makes sense." And Eileen was in town here. Bless her. Thank you, Eileen. And I called her. I, I registered. I I went to an evening at, uh, the night before that Kristen had, and I just showed up. And and you know, blessings that you did show up too. Uh, now now during this the seminar or after the seminar. How had things changed for you? I think the one thing, this, some structure in my life in which uh, doing the practice that you had suggested and keeping in touch with you as well and asking to be your student and receiving your guidance. And as that's continued and from the beginning, a deeper sense of God within me with that my my head knowledge always knew that God is there. I remember uh, teaching students. I, I taught a number of things in high school. One of them was religion one time for a few years, and telling them that we how, how much we were connected to God. And if we weren't, and God forgot us, I'd be looking out, and there'd be a pile of clothes sitting on their chair. That would be it. So I've always known that, but that's more head knowledge, and it it just that Chris and your teaching and your guidance and direction for me has provided experiences where I have connected in that way to the God within. And, and, and let's, let's, let's be clear that, that it's the Kundalini that is helping you. It is the Kundalini that you're, you're awakening. I mean, certainly from the level of the, the seminar, it, it's easy to place a face, you know, you have my face, you saw me at the sem seminar, gave you the Shakti Pot and all these things. And here you are here, and we're, we're talking face-to-face -face this way. How have the practices that I've given for you to do uh, helped you to, to experience those, those, uh, the phenomena and the connections that you talk about? I think the the mantras that you've given me uh, and the and remembering the the aspects of our life the five bodies and in the 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 prayer of those mantras of I surrender and carrying those over into other times as well um, and and the commitment to it morning and evening. 
And sometimes it's the last thing I want to do, and I don't think I even have the energy for it. But but I know it it tells me how important it is, even if for a moment I think it's not. Well, no, I understand that because we all have we all have those days when we just don't feel like practicing. Uh, for me, during my early part of uh, getting this body inundated, this physical form inundated with Kundalini, not the Kundalini that I was born with from a previous life, but the Kundalini that this body needed to have activated and awakened within it, I was praying and I was doing the five Tibetans. I was basically doing the safeties five times a day. And very, very, very sincerely, uh, and I didn't care if people saw me out in the park. I'd go out in the park with a blanket or a, or a, uh, a little rug that I had so that I wouldn't get all the stickers in me. And I'd do the five Tibetans, and I'd go right, you know, just as you see me do in the uh, in the videos uh, on YouTube with regards to doing the five Tibetans and then doing the practice after you do the five Tibetans, which I encourage uh, all those interested to go and watch. They're not very long, but 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 they do help. Uh, I I forced myself to do this too, and and I want to honor you, Rosemary, for forcing yourself. Even though you were tired, it shows a diligence and a dedication to your process that that isn't easy to come by. Uh, Amelia, how are the, how are my friends on the chat group uh, doing? Hi, Kristen. There are more guests after joining us, but so far nobody has made a comment um, or is asking a question. Um, okay, all right. Well, hello, hello, the new guests, and hello, everybody. I wish I could see you like I normally can, but my other laptop's not set up. So uh, welcome, and, and thank you for listening. Feel free to ask a question if you like uh, in person. Give us a call at 347 347- Nine three four zero zero two six. Um, Kristen, can I can I just say it was fascinating, uh, Rosemary. It was fascinating listening to your story about how you became a nun because I was also raised in the Roman Catholic tradition, born and bred a Roman Catholic. And as you probably know, as you definitely know, we were brought up with um, a belief that to become a priest or a nun was a calling from God. And, you know, I had read stories about how people were called by God through visions and such. And I always, as a child, I used to have visions. And, um, you know, I always had a very deep inner connection to God as a child. And when I read stories like that in my teenage years, (laughs) I was absolutely terrified that I would receive a call from God in the form of a vision to become a nun because I so did not want to become one rosemary. It, yes. um, and I thought if I received this calling, oh hell, you know, I, you know, I really believed I was going to have to become a nun. And I think part of the reason I didn't want to be a nun was because of the celibacy, you know, and not being able to have children and that. That was a huge thing for me. But the calling from God, you know, was something I think that I had all along except in those days, it was only in the context of the Catholic aspect. And it took a long, a much longer time for me to realize there are different, you know, I was called in a different way. And that's how then, you know, the Kundalini and all of that. So anyway, I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Amelia. And that is so true. Uh, in those times, it's not now, of course, thank heavens, but in those yeah. times, it was so exonerated with the, the 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 Catholic population, maybe outside the Catholic population too, that that was a superior way to follow God, and we are all called by God for a life that is is given to us, and maybe we could say designed for us. Yeah, and of great uh, that one is the one for us. Thank you. I agree. I agree, Rosemary. And and uh, and in that in that same uh, context, uh, Kundalini is that direct hand of the divine on your shoulder, uh, in your spine, in your tailbone, uh, activating and changing and transforming you. If you if you notice the the most common 
uh, action in the in the multiverse is the action of change. Change is always occurring. Transformation is always occurring. With the Kundalini, the level of transformation can be explicitly faster uh, than than the typical life after life after life that a person may have been subjected to before the Kundalini awoke. Uh, now your karma is is in real time with you now. Now you're not waiting to die and then processing the life that you have just left and then sculpting the new life to to uh, handle the karmas that were created and the karmas that have been in existence uh, from the previous life, the life that you had before you lived that life and passed away. And so as the kundalini comes into a person's uh, experience and equation, the level of difficulty can increase. Uh, because it is a real-time in your life, in your face, in your body experience right now, it can take on uh, huge proportions uh, compared to how your normal uh, life has been up to this point. So, you know, you you go to you, you're born, you're raised, you go to school, you you know, you go through all of the changes that occur for a human being, and you reach adulthood, and you know, you, you're educated, you get a job, you do this, this, and that, and you're your life is somewhat, uh, uh, if, if the kundalini hasn't come to you sooner, your life has reached a level of your participation where you're fairly organized and, and fairly cogent of what it is you uh, do in this world, how you make money, how, where do you live, uh, how do you express love, you know, where, who do you help, if anyone, you know, how do you feel about the government, the environment, the uh, the scholastic issues, all of these things. And then Kundalini comes in and really, really begins to accelerate your placement, your personal placement within the multiverse. And the reason why I say multiverse is because it isn't a universe. They're very, I mean, if you look at the Hubble Space Telescope, for crying out loud, you know, you look at the, uh, the deep field picture and you can see lots of little Milky Ways out there. Okay, and... uh uh, there is one physical plane, but there are many verses within that physical plane. So I usually use the plural multiverse. Uh, with the Kundalini, your your uh, complacency with life uh, will be changed. It won't be eliminated. Your complacency won't be eliminated, but challenges will be given, and they should be given. You know, when I wrote the safeties, I was basically concerned about Kundalini syndrome. Uh, the the safeties, this one guy came to the second seminar I ever put on, and uh, I wasn't sure about giving him Shakti Pot, but I went ahead and did it anyway. And I saw, I saw the result, and the result was not pretty. And uh, he he wasn't violent or self. You know, he didn't hurt himself or his family or anything, but he became very, 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 uh, well, he just had some issues, uh, issues that he didn't need to have had. If he had gone, if I, if I had uh, not done that and uh, he had more time for uh, refinement, uh, things could have gone a little bit easier. He was not, I mean, he did get some raised welts on his spine, but uh, other than, and those went away the very next day. So it was not anything that was lasting on a physical level, but there were plenty of things that were lasting on the mental and emotional level. And yes, indeed, his family had to deal with that as well as his employees and friends. So so this is what I'm trying to relate to you right now, is that you will encounter greater levels of difficulty as your awakening continues. Okay? Kind of look at yourself as, say, an Olympic springboard diver. And 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 you do this beautiful swan dive into the pool, and you barely make a ripple as as your body goes into the water. And wow, and you get nine nine nines or tens or whatever you know judges. But the degree of difficulty is only like say one. But now if you add to that swan dive two flips and a twist, <laughs> well the degree of difficulty just went up to like three or four. 
and and then you multiply that times 10 or whatever the judges give you, and that gives you that higher score. And, and the Kundalini will increase your degree of difficulty with regards to the problems and issues that it will present for you as you continue the Kundalini path. It's not supposed to always be easy. Matter of fact, uh, I was talking with a, a student earlier today, and we're talking about some dreams that, that uh, she had. And, and basically, uh, you know, the, the information that her Kundalini was giving to her through the dream life is that it will not always be easy. Sometimes you must suffer. But if you know what you're suffering for, it makes that suffering so much more worth it. You'll jump into that suffering just in order because you know you know what this is giving you. You know what this is bringing you. And you'll, you know, you'll go from the frying pan into the flame, and you'll be washing yourself in those embers. Happily so. Okay? So don't expect a smooth, easy ride in every aspect of your kundalini awakening equation, because it won't happen. I hope it doesn't happen anyway. It is my hope that you have to suffer a little bit, maybe even a lot depending upon your karma, in order to refine yourself in the physical real time, right now, present moment, refine yourself towards holding on to the kundalini in a much greater level of acceptance and surrender and serenity. You can be serene even as you suffer. If you know what you're suffering for, it doesn't necessarily take the suffering away. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, there are certain factions of the unknown that always lend fear into any equation. And if you know it and you can take that fear out of the equation, well, you can still suffer. <laughs> you know, if that's what your kundalini is calling for, you can still suffer and you can still have that refinement. Remember, karmic balancing is not always easy. Karmic balancing is about detoxing your karmic history and and many of the of the ancient sources will tell you you will pay your karma every little piece nothing is forgotten nothing is forgiven did you hear me say that nothing is forgotten and nothing is forgiven i.e. you don't get to have your karma removed because you did a good deed you get to have your karma removed when you balance that karma, i.e. you meet the karma. You embrace the karma. And by embracing and meeting that karma and doing whatever, whatever that karma equation requires of you, you're able to manifest neutrality within those two forces. So the positive has met the negative and your, your karma for that one situation has been balanced. And you move forward into the next level of karma or into the next aspect of the kundalini equation that your kundalini is giving to you. Okay? Uh, if anybody has any questions about this aspect of the kundalini awakening uh, experience, please feel free to call in at 347-934-0026. 347 347- 9340026. I would like to say a little bit about Rosemary. She's here. She's right in front of me. And now she's starting to cringe a little bit. Uh, legs are crossed and the arms are crossed in front of her. Her hand is over her mouth and she's kind of going, oh, jeez, what's he going to say? <laughs> Rosemary has been an absolute delight to have here. She flew out here uh, from her, her really cold home in Minnesota right now. Uh, to uh, on the 2nd of January, she flew out here and I picked her up and uh, we, we drove back home. And already, you know, she she is she's in the room. She's in the ashram. She's doing the work. She's doing her practice three times a day. I have her doing a practice. I mean, when you come to the ashram, don't expect to just sit around and 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 enjoy the radiance. Because you can do that. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> there are times when you can do that. But most of the time, even as you soak up that radiance, that radiance is going to push your equation. That radiance is going to push your equation. And by pushing the equation, I mean it is going to compel you 
to do more work on yourself, to do more work with your kundalini, to do more sincere surrendering uh, to, to your kundalini, to the kundalini teacher if necessary. Okay. Rosemary, as she sits here, I mean, she is a wonderfully, wonderful, she's so considerate. She's considerate to a fault. She, if she thought that passing you on a staircase would cause you inconvenience, she would, she would tie a rope off the balcony and shimmy down the rope in order to get to the ground floor rather than pass you on the stairs, if, if you see what I mean. So we've had some conversations about that. But by and large, she is just doing wonderful. We've gone to the Kundalini Forest, which is also goes by the name of uh, Armstrong uh, uh, Redwood Preserve. So if any of you want to Google that, these are the tallest trees in the world, which is why I call them the Kundalini trees, because the Kundalini is the most powerful energy and consciousness in this world, having created the physical plane uh, through the divine uh, induction uh, from, from the all that is. If any of you who are listening in the chat room have questions about this, or you'd like to, to come out and visit the ashram, stay at the ashram for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, as Rosemary's doing, uh, feel free to give us a call at 347-934-0026. And uh, Santara, can you tell us a little bit about how things happen for you when you're out here at the ashram? Hello, Crimson. Hi. Well, I flew uh, from Ireland to the ashram. I've been there a couple of times, and um, each time that I come there is different to the previous time, even though in in essence I do the same things in lots in lots of ways. And um, as Crimson says, I am I would have had a practice, but I would have done while I was there. And um, I definitely enjoyed the radiance. Um, which is very very special to be with to be with the teacher, but one of the things that that does occur you, you were talking there about um, being pushed, and it comes for me actually going there came as a push for my own Kundalini to go and visit Kriven and the ashram, and once I got there, other things became pushed because of the being in the radiance of Kriven because of um, Many, many, many things. And so things while I was there came up for me to deal with. I mean, you were speaking about refinement. I mean, a lot of refinement, I think, opportunities for refinement arise while you're in the ashram. And actually, when you come back, that process, when you come back home, that process continues um, to occur. Um, Going to the ashram, for me, has made a big difference to my Kundalini unfolding and, and my development prism in so many ways I hardly know where to start and um, yeah I mean I don't I don't and um, the safety is so I just want to say that the safety is I know that you're, you're speaking about the safety in terms of Kundalini syndrome and all of that but the safety for me are like an anchor are like something that um, is an anchor within the refinement because those are the things that I use in order to help me in a way through the refinement. They're the things that keep me grounded in a way and able to move through refinement, if that makes sense. So I pick and choose them as the different as different things come up for me to be refined. So in other words, forgiveness might be the thing that I particularly need to work on at a particular time or tolerance. And once I found, once I became aware of of the safeties and using them. I'm going back a bit now, but really using them. I hear you saying, you know, I do the safeties four times a day or five times a day, but really, I I sort of do them all the time. If that makes, you know, okay, you can only well, do the Tibetan you really so can't, many times can't, a day. You, you can't do the five Tibetans all the time. Yeah, exactly. But the other things, the other elements of, you know, the emotional safeties and the other elements of the safeties, those the, the things can be used all, all of those the time. Things. Yes, you can do all those. You can do the emotional safeties, the mental safeties, 
Uh, yeah. Even the ego, the ego safeties all the time, as you say. Uh, well put, uh, Amelia. Well put. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Rosemary, do you have a comment about that? Yes, I, I thinking of that, particularly forgiveness, as you were saying that, Amelia, and have shared that with my family in an, an ordinary setting, and how quickly simplest thing of sitting in the airplane something happens and to be able to to forgive and be released and there's immediately energy and and the, the love back again I, i'm probably that's the thing that i'm most grateful for that i've learned from chrism and and just looking over the past that was part of my journey from since the seminar yeah, and I would like to, to interject something in here that it doesn't matter how old you are or young you are. Um, you know, I had uh, this body received Kundalini in, in a big way at the age of 30. Uh, uh, how old were you, Amelia, when it really came up? Final um, oh, my goodness. 2007. So I was. You were like <laughs> Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how old. I'm like, 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 like. No worries. You don't have to count it. I You're using your fingers. I, I can tell. I was 37, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I was 37. <laughs> Here's Rosemary. No, I was 47. Was, I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I, how, how old were you when you came to the seminar? 71? 70? Seventy-one, I think. And how do you feel as you're doing your practice now? I, I just feel who I am. I don't feel my age. I don't, and I, I'm healthy. I have no medication. I have, I don't look even my age. Um, so I feel well. I, I, I am rejuvenated. What happened? What happened to you last night with your Kundalini? Oh, I, I was sleeping under a couple comforters since I've come here, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I woke up and I was hot. And I said, "Oh my goodness, that's some progress." And that's all I knew. And I went back to sleep. Is that normal for you to have heat like that? No, not at all. Uh, so yeah, so this, this, oh boy, let me. Uh, hope I didn't take myself out of here. There we are. Hello. Uh, Amelia, could you, or actually, uh, people in the in the uh, ar- uh, not in the archives in the chat group, is the sound quality coming through? Could you ask them that, Amelia, if they're if they're not hearing me? I will. I do that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So so I wanted them to say that simply because there is no age limit. I mean, yeah. If you're an infant, you may have a difficult time doing the five Tibetans if you haven't learned to crawl or walk yet. So there is somewhat of an age difference there. If you're 98 years old, you're infirm, you have Alzheimer's, you have diabetes, and you've had two of your lower limbs amputated, it might be hard to do the five Tibetans or any of the, you know, some of the other things. But it's never difficult to do the emotional uh, safety. Yes, Amelia. Yes, the sound is coming through. They say it's good, it's fine. Oh, my gosh. No. Well, well, wonders never cease. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> no, <isn't> it, perhaps <laughs> this is a new, a new thing for 2014. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> uh, we can hope. We can hope. Okay, well, there's yeah. something else. There's another uh, phenomena. This is a phenomena subject that I'd like to talk about. And one of the students is experiencing this right now. And it's a fairly common phenomena within Kundalini phenomena. And this is seeing the Eye of Horus. The Eye of Horus is an Egyptian symbol that will occur on the left eye only. Uh, it is a very stylized uh, symbol of an eye in an Egyptian format. This is another symbol of the kundalini as it communicates itself to you. So if you some some people will just see that eye appear in front of them out of the blue 
Nobody else will see it but them. Okay? And if you look up the Eye of Horus, that's H-O-R-U-S, on Google, and then you look at the images, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, this is a representation of the Kundalini. Don't let anybody tell you different. A lot of people that don't have Kundalini, you know, they'll, they'll come up with, a, with an idea of what it's supposed to mean. And you may look on Wikipedia, and Wikipedia will tell you what it thinks it is. And the Oxford scholars in England who've never had Kundalini, they'll make their guesses and their whatever, you know, their theories and, and uh, you know, uh, about what the Eye of Horus does. But it is the Kundalini. And eventually, as they, as they matriculate upwards... Uh, into their development, they will come t- uh, into that knowledge. But the eye of Horus will come to a person. It'll come to you in your dreams. It'll come to you in your waking life. And it's not like the eye is going to blink at you or, you know, you're not supposed to like so much uh, communicate with the eye. But when you see it, know what it is. And that knowledge alone begins a part of the process that it, it's almost like the Eye of Horus is a key that unlocks a, a, a door or a room in your Kundalini awakening process. And that process is at the same time a, a history lesson as you go into the ancient Egyptian schools, which are basically the uh, the Egyptian schools are, are firmly based in the Atlantean schools. And I know I'm going to lose some of you here when I say the word Atlantis. But it was real, and it occurred, and, and the, uh, the forces that caused the dismemberment of that uh, continent uh, migrated to the different areas that were not sinking, and they took their technology with them, and the Egyptians took some of that technology, and, and uh, the, uh, the Maya, the Toltecs, Olmecs, they took some of that technology, the Iroquois took some of that technology, and some other uh, 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 human organizations took that technology, uh, you know, and, and, and you can kind of see that through the the preponderance of huge pyramids all over the globe, off the coast of Japan, off the coast of Cuba, in Bosnia Herzegovina, and oh yeah, in the Egyptian uh, pyramids as well. And and I'm sure that uh, if, if if uh, if we wanted to find more pyramids throughout the world, we would find them. We would find them. And let's also look at a cone or, or some of the turrets that you have, the onion domes of, of Russia, the, uh, the, the, the domes of Buddhism and the domes of, of uh, Muslim and Hinduism. A dome is basically a cone, C-O-N-E. And a cone is basically a pyramid with an infinite number of sides. Okay? That's what a cone is, what a dome is. It's a pyramid with an infinite number of sides. In other words, it's a pyramid, it's a move, it's a moving pyramid that's spinning so fast that you wouldn't be able to see all the sides. And so uh, if you want to know more about pyramid power and the power of cones, uh, you can look at uh, Patrick Flanagan, C-L-A, uh, F-L-A-N-A-G-A-N. And Patrick Flanagan is a doctor, and he wrote a bunch of books about uh, the pyramids and the force of the pyramids uh, back in the early 70s. I don't know if you can still get his books, but I do remember uh, as, a, as a young person reading his books and understanding, beginning to understand uh the levels of power through pyramids. Um, and it's real. It's a real deal. You know, they didn't make pyramids accidentally or because they thought it was a cool-looking structure. It was definitely energetic, uh, uh, energetic modulation and materialization from these, these structures. Uh, and so you, when you look at uh, the Masonic uh, uh, information, Masonic is all based on the Egyptian uh, mystery schools, which, as I just said, are based on the Atlantean mystery schools. And you'll see that they use the pyramid and the all-seeing eye and all of that stuff. Uh, the all-seeing eye would be the eye of Horus, which is the Kundalini. And the 33rd degree within the Masonic understanding is the Kundalini. So you can kind of see how this is wrapped already into our society and into our understanding. It's on our money. 
the United States money at least, you know. Uh, so, so we're already kind of living within the the refinement protocols of the Kundalini, whether we know it or not. We as a society, as a world society, are living amongst all these sacred, huge sacred objects, these pyramids, these sphinxes, these these obelisks. An obelisk is another. I mean, you know, it's a very obvious Shiva Lingam, for one. Uh, you know, there, there are many, many, many areas of mystical intervention that are promoting and guiding and sculpting our spiritual uh, evolution in many, many different ways. Even if you look at the Christian cross, the Christian cross isn't so much about a cross. It's about where those, where that cross intersects, and it intersects at the heart. And so Jesus, as he's crucified on the, on the, uh, on the cross, isn't really advertising his torture. He's advertising where, where the linear, where actually where the vertical and the horizontal meet is at the heart chakra. And if you look at some of his other pictures, you see him pointing towards the heart. You'll see his heart lit up by a, by a light, a halo around the heart. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about drinking his blood and eating his flesh. Oh, my word. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Let's teach everybody to be a cannibal, shall we? Um, it's 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 about the heart. It's about divine love. It's about receiving the Eucharist in a way that allows you to understand it. It's about love. He didn't give his body so that you'd have something to eat on Sunday. Okay? <laughs> Rose, Rosemary, do you have a comment about that? Well, thank you. Yes, very simply said. Yes, it's funny. <laughs> Sorry, I seriously, folks, I don't mean to offend any Christians out there, but there are meanings within Christianity that are not being given to Christianity. Just like there are meanings in his, Hinduism that are not being given to the Hindu. There are meanings in Buddhism that are not being given to the Buddhist. Because you haven't reached that level of understanding yet. You will. You will. Through the process of spiritual refinement, you will eventually reach that level. And I don't care if you believe in reincarnation or not. Reincarnation believes in you. And that's enough. Uh, so if you have any questions about this topic, okay, we're, we're on our fourth topic now. I'd like you to call. Three four seven nine three four zero zero two six. Amelia, are there any questions from the uh, the chat group people? No, Chris, and it's very quiet there, and more people Jeez, have joined us. Did I scare you all? So did, did I? I think you did. <laughs> <laughs> Sue has joined us. Sue Homer, as has hey, uh, Fashji. How are you, Sue? Fashji. Nice. Fashti, good, good. Hello, Fashti. Yeah. And Julie is there. Julie, Julie. I love that picture you posted, Julie, on the Facebook uh, 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 ashram group. Very beautiful, very beautiful. Wow, okay. And Linda D is there. Who's that? What? Linda D. Linda D. I'm assuming Denny, but I could be wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Hello, Linda. Hello, hello, hello. (laughs) Well, thank you all. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Amelia, yeah, for, for forwarding, uh, you know, their presence to me. Well, so Julie let's... is typing now, so she's saying ah, thank okay. you So okay. with a smiley face. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, I'm going to talk about something that goes against the grain of most Americans right now. I'm going to talk about prostration, P R O. S T R A T I O N prostration. Look that up on on uh, Google or Wikipedia, or if you have a an actual dictionary, uh, page through and look up the word prostration. In the Kundalini context, sometimes you will be given to prostrate yourself, and I think this is where the whole idea of prostration came from. Is from the Kundalini. 
I have people practice something that is a physical form of Trataka, T-R-A-T-A-K-A. Uh, Trataka places the person in a position where the base of the spine is the highest part of the body towards uh, towards the, the the solar deity or the or the sun. It is the earth lifting itself to the heavens, so that the heavens can can uh, bring themselves down to earth, and they join there during the Trataka at the base of the spine. This is activation Kundalini. Okay. As you do forms of prostration, the other form of prostration is to just literally prostrate yourself uh, to the kundalini, to your teacher, to that source of kundalini information for you or kundalini experience for you. I'm not necessarily advertising, oh, please, prostrate yourself to Christmas, because really, really, folks, it, it's not that for me. Uh, I have plenty of people who do that. But uh, it isn't uh, anything that, that is required of you. It is, however, required of you if your kundalini gives you that challenge, shall we say. Definitely for, for people in Europe, uh, people in France who just, oh, my gosh, never do that. People in the United States, oh, my gosh, never do that. Well, I'm going to say, yeah, 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 do that. Do that if you're in France. Do that if you're in Switzerland. Do that if you're in Spain or Germany or, or Sweden or Norway or Finland, the beautiful country of Finland. Do that if you're in the United States or Canada or Mexico or Australia. Do that if you're in, in any part of the world. If your kundalini compels you to, to prostrate yourself to, to uh, a, a, a symbol of the kundalini or an image of a teacher, then do that. Do, and do it without hesitation. However, don't do it in front of other people if you can help it. Most people will not understand what you're doing and they may be afraid, they may be frightened, they may feel that you've been uh, uh, taken up by a cult. Uh, especially if you're doing it to a living teacher, uh, you know, be very, very uh, considerate of the people around you. Uh, go into your bathroom. Go into your bedroom and do it that way. I mean, this is, this is, if your kundalini compels you to do this, it wants you to do this and you need to do this for the health of your kundalini equation within you. You need to do this. Okay? Don't run away from it because it's foreign to you or because your ego is shrieking at you. No, no, no. Never bow down to another human. Here's, here's uh, Rosemary has something to say about this. Thank you, Chris. I, I'm remembering it was maybe in December. Yeah. November even when I get to the evening uh, practice before I went into bed and, and a number of times, and I even mentioned it to you. And what does that mean? And you said, you just perhaps that my kundalini wanted me to do that. But it was a very strong desire just to be flat on my stomach, on my, my face. I would find some way to prop up my <coughs> forehead. And, and it was the desire to go deeper. And like I just wanted to be absorbed by the earth. And um, it, it was a desire, but frustrating as well. But, but um, I was glad to know that it was in a realm of something, quote, normal in, in the terms of a kundalini path. And I imagine as I got up, I was given something for that. You know, it didn't happen every day, but significant times enough. And it did give me, as it gave me something. I can't tell you now what that was, but it did. I, I think it gives you, it gives you a gift of recognition that you have indeed followed the the urging of your kundalini and that will often come in forms of bliss too bliss is often used as a reward uh type of thing although it's not pavlovian it's not like when you ring a bell well you're going to start salivating for bliss right <laughs> would that it were so easy <laughs> ring a bell oh i got bliss 
um, that would be very nice. That would be very fun. Um, but yeah, uh, this is this is not very easily accepted uh, by others around you. So be very considerate uh, with who is around you. And if you're a Kundalini awakening man or woman, and your spouse is is interested in Kundalini or you know wants to be supportive of your equation, it doesn't automatically mean that they're ready to have it awaken in them. And try as you might and fantasize as you might. And, and uh, you know, they may want to have kundalini so much that they even go into to having little mini kriyas or little things of that nature. And, and uh, I don't want you to think that just because you have it that everybody around you is going to get it. It's not the case. Not everybody's ready for it. They shouldn't get it. And, uh, and be grateful for your process, but don't feel that you need company in that process. I know it's nice to have, and, and sometimes spouses are in co- competition with each other, and it's like, well, if, if she gets to have kundalini, well, then I should have kundalini too. I'm the spouse here. But it doesn't mean that you get to have the kundalini. It may mean that you need to support somebody who's having the kundalini first. It may mean that you need to pay that tithe, that agreement that you support a person having kundalini. It's not necessary that everybody has kundalini who is married or is that a boyfriend or girlfriend. You don't need to have that kind of company. And if you do desire that kind of company, that's something that the kundalini and you are going to work on from an egotistical level. Okay. It's the ego that wants company, not the kundalini. It's the ego that feels lonely, not the kundalini. Okay. Uh, For any questions about this, if you'd like to talk about this with me, you can call 347-934-0026. Or if you have any question about your Kundalini Awakening process, feel free to give us a call. Um, uh, Covering some ground today, I tell you, right now, right now, uh, it's 407 on, on on the West Coast of California, and uh, I want to go back a little bit. I want to go back to our Fukushima program. I made a mistake with regards to the type of iodine to purchase and to take for yourself, and it is not atomidine. Atomidine, through the Edgar Cayce uh, uh, um, information, is excellent for the body and, and for boosting the body immune system and for boosting the uh uh, the thyroid and, and for just basically helping the body in general realign the glandular secretions. But for radiation protection, it's, it's potassium iodine that you need. And I'm going to suggest Lugol's, L-U-G-O-L-S, potassium-based uh, iodine. This is what will help you uh, defend against any any iodine-based nucleotides that have been released uh, into the Pacific or into the air from Fukushima. So it is potassium iodine that you're going to want to look at. So please know that. I wanted to make that correction. Um, uh, let's see. I just finished up the Shakti pot for the winter solstice, and I want people to know that I do Shakti pot, distance Shakti pot, Every uh, solstice and equinox, and only on the solstice or the equinox or at the uh, the seminars. Uh, with the seminars, uh, yeah, uh, you know, just by coming to a seminar, you're going to sit in that radiance, and that radiance will actually begin to give you a, a shakti pot as you're <laughs> as you're listening to the 16 hours of information that that I give. Uh, during those seminars. And it's not all didactic information, i.e. I. it's not all you sit and listen type of stuff. That would just that would just put me to sleep, especially if I was watching me giving a seminar. It would put me to sleep in the first five minutes or less. Uh, but, but for you, there's experiential uh, 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 refinement uh, practices that are given in the uh, the seminars. So I don't want you to think that it's all just sitting there and getting information. Information is great in the Kundalini. It is power. 
It gives you an understanding, and that understanding can obliterate fear. And I'm all about taking away some aspects of the fear, not all aspects of the fear. Some fear aspects, it is your job to take away. It is your karma to take away. So not all things are going to be done for you by a kundalini teacher and shouldn't be done for you. That kundalini should, teacher should be able to see in you what areas of fear and trauma and terror you need to experience. Did you hear what I just said? Sometimes you need to feel that terror. If you don't feel terror, how can you meet fear? How can you come through your fear? How can you accept your fear if you don't have fear? Fear is a very organic thing. It's very close to your heart. It's very close to your head and definitely close to your mind and your ego. Okay, So some fear will be lifted from you with information about the kundalini, but some fears will not. And new fears will be created just to see how you handle it. Kundalini, once it's up, is never, ever put away. It's up, it's up. That genie is, it's a one-way exit out of that bottle. And you don't, you don't, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Now, with Kundalini, if, if you know, your, your, your process is, is, it can be put on hold. It'll still be up, but it won't be as active as it once was. And it won't, you know, it's not all about driving you into the psych ward. Okay. When I say that you can't put the genie back in the bottle, it doesn't mean that the genie doesn't know that you're not ready to have this mentally. You're not ready egoically, and it'll start giving you tests of your mental mind, tests of your ego body, tests that come in the form of fear, tests that come in the form of opportunities to give love, tests that come in the form of opportunities to experience greed or power or domination over others or over the environment, things of that nature. These are all tests. These are not, uh, you're not achieving so much as you're, as you're being tested. Okay, you're being tested with how you handle the fear. Uh, I'm going to switch subjects now and I'm going to come straight over to some things because there's a plenty of people on the internet that say they have the Kundalini. There's, gosh, there's so many things out there, you know, Reiki teachers and Kundalini teachers and people that said, oh, yes, I've been to the seven bardos and, and I've gone through, you know, into the ultimate light of the angels and I've been face to face with God and we've, you know, all of this stuff. If you hear, if you hear a Kundalini person or, you know, a, a Kundalini person bragging about how far they've awakened and what power they've done and, and all of this stuff, walk away gently, politely. But don't, I would suggest that you not listen to this person. This person has not yet, uh, this person has not yet fallen away from self-aggrandizement. Uh, the kundalini does not support self-aggrandizement. The ego is supporting self-aggrandizement. Self-aggrandizement is bragging about where you have gone with the kundalini, boasting about how powerful or how knowledgeable or about how wise you are within the kundalini. This is not the kundalini that does this. This is the ego that does this. And so let that be an addendum to your levels of discernment when you're looking at a kundalini teacher or somebody that, that you feel is, the, is, is, is a teacher that you'd like to follow. See how much self-aggrandizement they put out there. And if, and if they're basing a lot of it upon on the accomplishments that they feel that they have done with regards to kundalini awakening, I will suggest that you politely teach yourself from those teachings. You don't hear me saying, oh, yeah, I've done this and I've done that. Because you know what? I haven't done any of it. Kundalini does all of it. Okay. Do you understand? 
If you have any questions about this, call the number, 347-934-0026. Uh, do you have anything to add to this, Rosemary? That topic? Well, um, I would say I thought about this. That being with Chrisom is always um, just very touching because it is that radiance that he mentioned. And that's confronting sometimes. And at the wait, same... Wait, wait, wait. Uh, how do I treat you uh, in the truck and, and when, I, when, I, when I see things going sh- a little bit out of balance? What happens? <laughs> well, you tease and you... Uh, it, 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 um, it works. And then I just end up having to laugh because I, I don't um, see the... the I, I don't see that side of what I'm saying. I'm seeing it from my own ego or my wanting to explain or be right. Yeah, be right. Thank you. And um, I learned last October when I was here and also r- learned probably every day that when whatever I say to you, if there's a correction and I say something about it to you, thinking that it's wise and enlightening and, um, it probably is more drama and all that kind of stuff that I'm digging myself deeper into the where I'm being corrected, and it's just kind of funny. Well, I have to say, just for everybody's uh, knowledge, it, Rosemary is quite wise. Uh, you don't it, let, let, look at the segue uh, going into becoming a nun at the age of sixteen. And staying in that refinement opportunity for 25 years. And then, oh, this isn't working for me anymore. And then, oh, you know, getting married. And then, oh, looking at the Kundalini and, you know, all of a sudden being drawn into the Kundalini. I mean, this, you know, there's there's quite a, a long range from Catholic, being a Catholic nun to walking the path of St. Francis of Assisi or St. Philip of Neri or St. Teresa of Avila or, or St. Hildegard. It's, it's, it's a very, especially nowadays when everything is, is being so denigrated through, through the practices of people who are, we're, we're counting on to be spiritual mentors and they turn into spiritual tormentors. You know, i.e., some of the priests in the Catholic Church, or some of the priests in any of the churches. I'm not going to just pillory the Catholic Church because I know darn well it's happening in all the other churches, including the the Muslim churches and the Christian churches and the Hindu churches and the Buddhist churches. You know, people are acting out their their uh, ego based uh, desires upon the people who are coming them coming to them for less than ego-based in di- uh, desire studies and religious study and spiritual instruction. So if you if you come up to a teacher that is that is basically bragging about what they do and how they do, I will suggest that you gently and politely walk away from that information. Uh we you know, we don't base our personality uh in and we don't base our own uh, relevance within self-aggrandizement. This is not allowed by the Kundalini. Yeah. The one thing that I had wanted to say is that I have, I haven't said this to Christian, but it's clear to me uh, that he is a gifted man in that spiritual realm, and through that, uh, brilliant man knows more about all kinds of things that most people I know don't know. And that's where I I run into things as well that I say are funny and just has a lot of stuff to poke fun at. But underneath that, I mean, it, it's wise, brilliant, just and the heart of it is his heart. And, and that's no matter what he says or even if it's harsh and, and brusque, uh, um, that that loving person he is is never gone. Well, well, thank you. I don't know about the wise or brilliance, um, but but I do have a lot of love for people, and I do hold that for people. Um, so moving onward, thank you, Rosemary, for those kind words. Uh, moving onward, 
I want people to understand that any of you are welcome here at the ashram, just like Rosemary, just like Amelia, just like any of the other people that have come out and visited. However, before you come out, I would like you to read the safeties and to begin a strong practice of the safeties, just like Amelia has done, just like Rosemary has done, just like many people who have come out here have done. You begin to practice the safeties on your own first. You begin to establish a relationship with the kundalini by practicing kundalini awakening safeties first before you come out here and and sit in radiance. The radiance is going to unlock certain levels of toxins within your system that need to come out. And oh my gosh, sometimes they come out hot and heavy. So you need to establish a communication with your own divinity primarily because this is what is going you know you come out here and yes you'll sit into my radiance but it is your own divinity that that radiance is waking up and so you have have definite manifestation from that spiritual connection you'll debt you'll definitely get uh, levels of detoxification happening Uh, a lot of you you know i get slandered a lot because people people don't agree with with you know how the kundalini wants things to be done here and i will i will tell you right off the bat right now this is this is a very very hot environment when it comes to kundalini uh activation kundalini awakening kundalini uh phenomena this is a very hot environment for this rosemary just had some of that heat coming to her (laughs) and she's and i want to say she's long past at 73 She's long past any kind of menopausal, uh, 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 you know, hot flashing. hot flashing or any of that stuff that that a lot of people uh, uh, will attribute to Kundalini. So, oh, you know, I'm having Kundalini. It must be a hot flash. And oh, I'm 52. <laughs> so, so uh, neither neither. And, and I want to bring Amelia into this as well. Amelia, come on, would you? I'm on prison, yes. Um, I would like you to re- to respond to some of that too. How does how how do you feel uh, with regards to your practice of the safeties and and uh, I would like your uh, your I would like you to to comment on prostration. I would like you to comment on Tritaka. I would like you to comment about practicing the safeties before you come to the ashram. Okay, and you go. You okay. Go. <laughs> okay, here I go. <laughs> well, I, I'm still, my head is still stuck in, in the heat and menopause, me being around that 52 mark. <laughs> <laughs> except, except I'm not menopausal yet, imagine that. And, but the but, heat but, but is your, amazing. Your, your, your phenomena goes far beyond just heat, though. Oh, yeah, it does, it does. But it's, anyway, it does indeed, yeah. But, um, okay, so... To get back to the safeties, I mean, my I suppose my journey started with um, getting into the safeties very gradually. And I mean, I think that's the way to do it. Begin to read the safeties and become familiar with them. And I would have started off practicing, say, forgiveness. And what's that other word that um, when I used to write down different things? So I began to do it different, you know, slowly. Also- to begin with. The recapitulation, that? That's the one, yeah. That was very powerful for me at the beginning of my, you know, when I became aware of the safety. Explain, explain down. the recapitulation. Explain that, would you? Yeah, well, for me, what I used to do was I would think of um, some things that had occurred that I needed to forgive in my life. So there were particular things, of course, that everybody has that stand out. So I started with those. And I wrote down what had happened. And as, as I began to do that process, I came to know what it was that I had to forgive. And I began to write my forgiveness. And what was revealed to me also during that was how much I also needed to forgive myself. And that was a new thing for me. Um, and so writing it down was extremely helpful. And then I used to burn the paper. And then... As I began to do that process, I also found that things would just come up then of their own. 
and I began to work through not just incidences, but work through forgiveness with particular people. And it just opened up a huge area for me around forgiveness, and I got really deeply into it from my past. And then it became something that I started to do in my present. I mean, you, you constantly talk about, you know, forgive the person that pulls out in front of you in the car. And that's exactly what I started to do, you know, forgiveness in the moment. And so working on the safeties and say just again, the forgiveness aspect from the past and the present just sort of unfolded and became part of my everyday uh, practice. And then as time moved on, I didn't need to do the um, capitulation, the recapitulation anymore. So I don't do that anymore now. Um, but the forgiveness still is a constant thing with me. Um, and so the other things, the things like tolerance, I mean, when Kundalini comes up and amplifies and, and definitely scenarios and situations can become so amplified that I found my tolerance, in a way, it's exactly what's the challenge, that I became intolerant because the situation was very difficult, for example. Well, then I would choose the safety of tolerance. It was the last thing that I wanted to do. Do you know? So I, I, what is it that I, I'm feeling intolerant? So I choose tolerance. And I would actively become tolerant more tolerant, more understanding, more compassionate within a scenario that would be happening for me. And that isn't always easy. But it's like what you were saying earlier, it's the commitment to doing it. And once, you know, again, once I began to do that and add that safety, that became something that goes on in my life now all the time. Um, it's still not always easy, but it is something that... Um, is, is part of my life and all the other safeties that, that are there as well. And so those would be, you know, those need to be practiced because when I arrived to the semin to the not the seminar, the ashram, um things are amplified and detoxifications and stuff within me and my ego and what my ego, you know, likes to do and control would come up to me and if I didn't have the safety as part of my refinement process and with the amplification and with being within the radiance, it becomes extremely, um, it, could, it could explode. And it kind of ties on occasions, but it quickly, comes, it quickly comes back with that anchor, you know. And so it's, it's I think if anybody... She, she, she once exploded half my mustache off. <laughs> if anybody is moving along, if anybody is going to go to the ashram, I would really recommend, or I really would suggest that, you know, the safety have to become part of what it is that you are doing before you get there. I would really recommend that. Plus, they're a wonderful benefit and a blessing in my life. Um, Another thing that I have found, you know, when the Kundalini awoke in me and, and I had what I call the Kundalini um, event, that was a very devotional event for me. I mean, it, was, it went on for quite some time. And so because as well of my past experiences as, as a child with, I suppose, mystical sort of visions and things, I, I, I had this connection to being devotional. And so very early on in my process, exactly as Rosemary has described, I would find myself, you know, prostrating myself um, to my Kundalini, being totally um, given, you know, to wanting to surrender to my Kundalini and wanting to find some way that I could do this as... Um, it, within my physical body. I mean, I can do things like I can give service, I can be loving, I can be more tolerant, I can be all of these things. But the Kundalini is felt within my body to such um, a degree that my body also needs to do something itself. And when I say body, I'm not, it is my physical body, but I mean all of, all of what is in that of me. And so... The prostration 
with a, a way of doing this for my physical body, as Rosemary said to you, of connecting to the earth, of surrendering myself to the all that is. I mean, there is such a freedom that comes and such a union and a connection that, that occurs between the divine and the physical body that is divine as well. Um, prostration is something that I really think people should open themselves to considering. Because I think in society it is something that we don't consider anymore. Yes, we do consider it. I mean, again, within the Catholic Church, prostration and all this sort of thing goes on, but people don't even give it a second thought in lots of ways. It's just like some old routine that used to happen way back in the 60s and 70s, and we've objected to all of that sort of thing, and we've become, you know, we've lost a lot of things. And I think prostration is something that offers us a great deal, um, that connection between us. If you're interested in prostration, at least the way I'm teaching prostration, uh, send me an email to k f i r e f o r a l l at yahoo dot com. So that's k fire for all at yahoo dot com, and I'll send you the link for the uh, for the prostration video to be done. I wonder, Amelia. Let me ask your opinion on this. You too, Rosemary. Do you think I should just open up that prostration video to the public? Let me let me have some responses from the chat group. What do you folks think in the chat group? Should I just open that up to the public? Let's see what people have to say about that. What do you think? Okay, will I, will I talk about what um, the prostration uh, video is? Uh, yeah, the one where you stand. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I would have done earlier on, I mean, there is the prostration of just lying upon the ground, but there is also the other one of standing and lying and standing and lying. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, the one that where Brad, I showed, you know, Brad was showing everybody what. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I, I, I think you should. <laughs> I didn't Rosemary? realize it wasn't available. I, I haven't seen that, so I, I wouldn't comment. But it, it would seem uh, helpful. <laughs> well, well Bashti, Bashti has just typed in. I think it would be helpful, Chrism. And I can see a few more people typing. Okay. And Bastille. somebody has just Bastille. logged. Bastille. Somebody has just logged out. <laughs> <laughs> they, they ran away. So soon. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Um, oh dear, I probably caused that. And um, Julie says it would help. All right. All right. Then I'll go ahead and, and open that. And then Julie says it's a good video. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and somebody else is typing as well. Um, Thank you, Fashi. Thank you, yes, Julie. You, Sue says, yes, I would watch it. Sue, thank you. And Sue, Sue, thank you for coming. I think this is your first live uh, show, I think, isn't it? Thank you, Sue. Sue Homer, everybody. Yes, and also Spirit Bird says, hi, all. I think you should post the video, person. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Spirit Person. Okay. So, anyway, (laughs) that's. Yeah, so that's that's kind of me and 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 how important I feel prostration is and what a gift it is that we give to our physical body when we allow it the freedom to do that. So I'll be quiet now. <laughs> oh no, no. Well, thank you, thank you, Amelia. Thank you very okay. much for for giving giving us you know your take on these things. I want people to have multiple takes with this because you know they can listen to me till the cows come home, but you know if 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 what I'm saying or the quality of my voice or the quality of my energy just doesn't work for them, well, maybe some of the, you know, some of the, the people that are taking my instruction and, and, and following these, these, these uh, teachings that I'm giving, you know, maybe that will help open a door for somebody. If it helps one person, then it's been worth it, okay? Uh, if you have any questions about your Kundalini Awakening experience, uh, feel free to call us here in the last 25 minutes. Uh, it's 347-934-0026. Now, I want to say something to Fasci. I still have your little thing that I have to mail to you, so so it's coming your way. Uh, and with those of you on the uh, Facebook group, the Kundalini Awakening! Exclamation uh, point, you might 
find some of the topics that I brought up today are being experienced there. Certainly the self-aggrandizement issue is being uh, expressed there. So for those of you that belong to that group or for those of you that wish to belong to the group, uh, please uh, go over to Facebook, go to groups, go to Kundalini Awakening exclamation point. That is that little, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's like an eye with a dot under it. We're enjoying that group. I would like to add something to this. Now, I'm running into a lot of people that, that you know, they want to do ayahuasca. They want to do some sort of a of an entheogen or an herb or a, a drug that gets them into the kundalini quick. And I don't want you to come into the kundalini quick. It is not a race. It is not about coming into this type of a process that can literally destroy your life. If you're coming into Kundalini uh, through the use of a recreational drug, uh, you're, you're putting yourself in a jar of needles and shaking that jar. And I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to do that. You do not require ayahuasca. Now, if you're going to do a drug in order to experience Kundalini, which I don't recommend, but if you're going to do it anyway, regardless of whether I recommend it or not, do, I, do the ayahuasca. Okay, and and do it with a real shaman. Do it with uh, with you know with a real shaman, somebody who knows how to sing the ceremony. It's a sung ceremony, i.e. la 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 la. Right? It's a sung ceremony. It's not somebody where you just pass out the tea and then then you know pass out on the uh, on the on the on the mat. Okay, uh, go down to to Pucalpa in Peru and, and, and find Ishmael, I-S-H-M-A-E-L. Uh, Ishmael is the son of one of the most prominent uh, uh, shamans in the region down there. And he himself is a shaman. And, and, I, and I, I went with Brad and another man named Very good ceremony. He thinks that he knows, he knows, finds out how this is working. And, uh, Better than some. I mean, we also went to another, went to to two two shamans down there with a dolphin shaman and Ishmael, and the uh, the, Ishmael, the Ishmael experience with the ayahuasca was the strongest. Um, so there's that. You don't need marijuana. You don't need uh, meth, uh, meth. What's it called again? No. Oh no, not methadone, but methamphetamine. You don't need meth. You don't need crystal or any of that stuff that you see on Breaking Bad on TV and all that. It's not that I have TV, but I, I, you know, I see it uh, advertised, you know, and I know that it's about the production and, and, and distribution of methamphetamine. You don't need that. You don't need cocaine. You don't need anything but human body. Kundalini is already there. But you have to follow the procedures to get it going in you. And following, you know, taking a drug and expecting to walk that short path, it can work for some people. I know, I know some very experienced, very beautiful, wonderful people that took acid in the 60s and had a kundalini awakening based upon that. You know, these are leaders in the spiritual movement at this time right now. You some of them, and of course, I'm not going to mention their name, but but uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you can do it that way, but it's a perilous journey, it can kill you, and I'm not going to recommend it. I'm going to recommend you do the safeties if you do the safeties twice a day, like Rosemary was talking about, that's a standalone activation sequence, meaning standalone, meaning just by doing that alone you can begin to activate your kundalini. Okay. And this is the this is, to me is the best way to come into this consciously, not with a buzz. Come into this consciously. Okay. You don't need marijuana. Now marijuana doesn't hurt you. You know, I've never I've never supported marijuana as a uh, as a stepping stone into the kundalini, but it doesn't hurt you. Unless you get overly addicted to it, and then, of course, you know, your lungs, if you're smoking, you're going to take a real hit on that. Uh, and your your seventh chakra will also get burned out if, 
if you're if you're if you're doing a lot of marijuana because it'll it basically opens up the chakras and that buzz you feel is the energy leaving your body. Uh, it can burn out the seventh chakra. And I don't want you to have that. I want you to have a full thousand petal opening when your kundalini comes. Okay, you don't need to take a drug now. If you're taking medicines uh, for medical reasons, fine, fine. Uh, as long as they're not SSRIs, selected serotonin reuptake inhibitors. I don't recommend anything that's an SSRI, anything at all, okay? Uh, you're, you don't need to have your brain reformatted vis-a-vis the pharmaceutical industry, okay? If you're going to have your brain reformatted, let the kundalini do it. It knows far more than the pharmaceutical industry, and it doesn't have that greed impulse either. You know, so let the Kundalini work on your your activation sequence. Let it come from your own internal processes. If you practice the safeties, you're spinning with the uh, with the uh, five Tibetans. And oh, by the way, with the five Tibetans, you're supposed to feel dizzy. That is not an error side effect. When you spin to the right 21 times, or if you're just starting, you only spin six times. You're supposed to feel dizzy. It should, it should encourage you to lay down on your back and begin the second Tibetan. <laughs> That's the way I would teach it. So once again, you can go to chrism.kundalini on YouTube, and you can you can find the uh, the practice to do after the five Tibetans and two separate videos on how to do the five Tibetans, showing yours truly doing the five Tibetans. And yeah, well. <laughs> You know, it's just one of the other videos. So, so go ahead and uh, and, and check that out and see how that uh, works for you. Uh, with, I, I'm not going to ever say, I'm not going to give you medical advice. I don't like SSRIs, selected serotonin reuptake inhibitors, because of the the reformatting, the rechanneling, the regrooving that they do of your brain. Because I sincerely know that humanity has not reached the level of information and wisdom to know its own self. Humanity does not know its own brain. Pharmaceutical interests do not have a very detailed understanding of the human brain and what it's there for. They don't even recognize Kundalini. They don't recognize you know, the chakra system. They don't, know, they don't know anything about the energetic anatomy. And so they're not formulating their drugs with as much knowledge as they need to. Maybe they will in the future. And I, you know, I put that prayer out there. But right now they don't. They do not. And neither do your MDs know about the Kundalini so much. Now, out here on the West Coast, Sonoma County, uh, I, I have a friend who is a, who is a, a directing MD. And, uh, and, and he's actually on the, uh, the Yahoo group. He never posts, but he reads it. You know, and, and, and I met him in Trader Joe's the other day, and we're talking, and, and I'm asking how he feels, you know, about the information coming through on the group. And he says, he says, well, you know, my teacher and I, you know, we, we discuss some of the things that the, that the people on the group go through. And, and the one thing that, that I would only recommend is, is people need to go slower. And I, I agree with him 100%. It is not a race. And, and people like Foschi and Sue Homer and, and Amelia uh, and and uh, Julie and Magdalene de Deus and these are people Rosemary these are people that have the Kundalini right now coming up through them it's working on them and they know that it's not a race if you don't want to hear it from me maybe you you know email them talk with them join that Kundalini awakening exclamation point. And uh, converse with them. They're on that group. They'll talk with you. Okay? It is not a race. It's not something that you need to go very fast with. Matter of fact, sometimes the slower you go, the better things are. Okay? Now, I've got 15 minutes left. For anybody that would like to ask a question, feel free to call the number 347-934-0026. Uh, uh, do you have anything that you would like to add, Amelia? Amelia, did you go to the bathroom? Uh, can you hear me? Oh. Yep. 
There you are. Yeah, okay. Um, I, well, let me see. I suppose something that comes to me that has come up in one of the groups um, has to do with refinement, actually, as well. It's, um, you know, I really feel that everything that occurs for us is an opportunity for refinement. Would, would you agree with that? Yes. In a, yes. in a Kundalini context, and that, you know, refinement can't really be, well, it can be ignored, but when we ignore it, it per, you know, the, the cycle that we're within just continues, and that the refine. well, I found for myself anyway, that when I'm in that place, refinement demands that I make changes, and that I have work that I need to do, you know, self-work that I need to do. And um, that that's not such a bad thing. You know, sometimes we're in scenario. I can be in a scenario. I mean, I know now I look at things differently than I used to do. And what I would have perceived before as being, in inverted commas, bad, I don't see anymore as being bad. I see it as an opportunity for refinement and an opportunity to do work. Um, And so, in a way... You know, I won't use the word suffering now, but in a way it ties into what you were saying, that, you know, in that context, in the context of the Kundalini and refinement, um, everything is actually good. Everything is good. It's all good, as they say. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah. (laughs) But it can be challenging, (laughs) but it's all good. It can. (laughs) (laughs) Now, Now, it is. I have a, and Rosemary has reminded me of this now, so before we, we go off the air, I have a little thing that I take people who come out here to the ashram, I take them to, sometimes I'll take them to Yosemite, sometimes I take them down to Yogananda's ashram in Los Angeles, which is six hours away. Uh, sometimes I, you know, I'll take them to the Kundalini Forest, I'll take them to the ocean, uh, maybe Shasta, maybe the desert. Um one of the places I take people uh, typically is uh, is the one of the California missions uh, called the Archangel San Rafael, and this is one of the missions that Father Junipero Serra set up in the 1800s in order to benefit the spread of Christianity among indigenous nations, which you know that that is a whole karmic topic all by itself. However, as much as I tell you about bad entities and entities trying to possess you and doing these types of things, I will take a person down to this little chapel that is off the side of the main church. And in this little chapel, there is a very, very positive uh, entity that hangs out in this chapel. And it hangs out right near this one pew section of this chapel. And I have taken people there since my very first Kundalini Awakening seminar that, that I did in San Rafael. And I'm going to, to uh, ask Rosemary, what did you feel, Rosemary, when you went into that chapel? I could feel the energy of, of something. I don't have the words as you just described and you had told me that and you told me gave me some directions and it was it's very strong and how did it feel what did it do it was energy that's i'm i'm not i don't have the words there where 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 did it interact with you on your body if anywhere i think my around my Heart chakra. Okay. And that that area. And how did it feel? Did you have an emotion? Emotion of peace and love. Basically, yeah. So basically, heart chakra works. So, so if you do come out to the ashram, and once again, I I extend the invitation to all of you to start the safeties first, and then come out to the ashram. Um, if you mention the the entity in the chapel at Archangel San Rafael, then uh, then I might just take you on down there. Now Rosemary's writing something else here. Let me see that. Tell me about the bookstore lady. Oh. I can't. No, no, no. That's okay. You can do it if you want. Yes. There's 
Kristen mentioned a little bit ago about the Yahoo group and the Face Facebook group and this YouTube. this and the the community of Kundalini people around actually around the world. Well, in San Rafael, we went out walking and to see some other things and went into a, a, a bookstore. And he has more to tell you the value of the bookstore, but if he would like. But we went in and I didn't give it much of um, a Kundalini presence. And I just kept walking. And then the woman who I would think was the director, the owner, the manager, something, looked to our way and she said, Oh, you're the Kundalini man, aren't you? And she said, I've seen lots of your lot of your videos. So and from that I have a she helped Kristen find for me a beautiful C D and something else I'm not remembering now. But it but it it was a touching moment to know that there are people out there, a lot of people that we none of us will ever know or meet who are also sharing in this kundalini life in that way. Yeah, yeah, we went down to the uh Amelia will recognize the bookstore down there in San Rafael. Uh don't you you remember that, Amelia? Yes, I do, Kristen, and I remember the chapel very well as well and the entity and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We also went to the, you know, the Tibetan places and things like that and uh you know, you know, uh, so so we we when a person comes to the ashram, you know, we we travel, we travel to different places. It's all, you know, some of it is meditation, some of it is is uh, devotion, some of it is is just taking a walk with me around the town or something like that. Uh, sitting in the car is pretty. It, it, that's an experience in and of itself. Uh, but we're running. Some of it is just. It's allowing, it's, it's giving. You know, it's important to say this too, because at least it was for me, because I'm very busy. I had, you know, I, I was living my life. Now, when I come to the ashram, it gives me um, the opportunity, and like when I started to go there first, to open my eyes in a way that I might not have done at home. And when I come back, um you know, the way that you guide that, I mean, through very ordinary things like traveling or going into a bookshop or different things that happen. Um, there's a follow-through on that, you know, back in my in my life as well, where change has happened, where I've opened my eyes in a new way, where I perceive things, where I allow the Kundalini to actually show me things through you and through my own, my own um, experience. Um, I see things in a different way, having been to the ashram. And that happens every single time I go, you know. I want to go back now. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome to come back. I would like to thank, I would like to thank Amelia Centara and her husband, John, John O'Connor, and her children for uh, allowing this broadcast to even exist. Uh, the reason you're hearing this is because of them. Uh, it, it is all... It, it is their fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an honor. I mean, it's like it's like what Rosemary said about the people that that lady that you met in the bookshop. And um, I know what um, the difference having been guided to prison and to that source of Kundalini information for me has made in my life. And and my husband knows it because when I um you know, it has been fantastic for John because when we actually came across Christmas teachings and when we came across the experiences of other Kundalini people, my husband could see how normal I was, actually. <laughs> um, in, the, in the sense that, you know, he was aware of a lot of weirdy things that had happened to me. And and so he's very supportive as well of, of the information being being there and that's why we do this and i mean today on the kundalini awakening group exclamation group another lady has come because she accidentally in inverted commas came across your um youtube video and that's what it's about that's what it's about it's about networking and providing opportunities for people because if you're meant to be 
to hear this information, well, then you'll be guided to hear it. That's how I feel. And so there's the, the radio show and there's the YouTube and, you know, there's all the different venues that you provide, Prism. And all we're doing, myself and John, in supporting this is just supporting this so that, you know, people can arrive here and receive um, in that way. So it's an honor, you know. And it's okay. also, I suppose, in a way, it's also as a way of gratitude for what we have received, you know. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I would like to, to thank Rosemary Goliath. I'd like to thank Magdalene de Deus. I'd like to thank Foschi and Julie and Sue Homer and everybody who uh, who took the time out of their day today to listen to this broadcast. I would like to thank everybody who has sent a donation. Uh, it is very much appreciated, and we it keeps this, this little ashram here going. And I tell you what, it is a little ashram. We've got three bedrooms, one bathroom, so just FYI. Uh, you know, we're very considerate of each other here <laughs> with regards to, to personal space and and uh, bathing and washing and eating and all of these things. And so uh, you're welcome to come and visit here. Uh, you're welcome to to uh, inquire, I think, of Amelia uh, Centara. She has a lot of good information. And if you, if you prefer a beautiful Irish accent and a beautiful Irish woman, then you listen to her. You talk with her. <laughs> Communicate with her. She's, she's as wonderful in person as she is on, on, on the radio or on the Internet. She's really, she really oh, is, kind. and I encourage, <laughs> I encourage everybody to, to come to one of the seminars, uh, come to Rosemary's seminar, come to Amelia's seminars. I mean, seriously, folks, bring yourself into this condition. It is absolutely stunning, beautiful, amazing, beyond words. I mean, you know, as, as you know, some people may think that 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 I can string a few words together into a sentence, but my gosh, the Kundalini is what's doing that. I take very little credit for it. I mean, i got to take some credit because I went through those 23 years of, 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 of the process, but it's the Kundalini that's doing this work. It's the divine. Everybody who comes into this is becoming a divine human being, a saint on this world. And I know, I know people who have thought, oh, I'm no saint. <laughs> Gosh, if you look at my life, I'm no saint. Well, if you look at St. Augustine, this guy was a captain in the Spanish army, and, you know, he was killing people every day just for fun. Okay. Uh, you can be redeemed. There is redemption for people. And you, if you can forgive yourself, then you're halfway there. And if you can forgive yourself, then maybe you can help others forgive themselves. Maybe you could be a symbol of that forgiveness and that tolerance and that gratitude and that grace. I invite you to do that. I invite you to do these things. And so with the one minute and 45 seconds I have left, I would like to say thank you for listening to this uh, edition of your Kundalini Awakening experience. And, you know, hopefully uh, it has helped at least one person and we will be back next week. We will be back next week. Same time, same channel. I hope to see you all there. Amelia Centara, thank you for co-hosting this with me. You're very welcome. Goodbye, Rosemary. Goodbye, Chris. And goodbye, Mr. Rosemary, thank you for being my guest. Oh, thank you for having me as your guest. Okay, everybody. Bye-bye. See you next week.